What's up, YouTube? Welcome to another episode of The Dungeon, Dungeon Crashers. I'm Guy. And I'm Zapeel. And before we get started, let's get that like and subscribe button some love. Get that bell on if you want to be notified when we post new videos. Also, I would like to say a big thank you to everyone that has posted comments and build ideas so far. We appreciate the feedback, so keep it coming. We would also like to give a big shout out to the people over at Castle, Castle of Games in Springfield, Oregon. Uh, they have a knowledgeable staff and great selection of books, figures, board games, and dice. Um, it's still in the works, but I've talked with one of the owners, and they are setting up a large game room with a concession stand, and he said it would be all right if we came and filmed during one of their gaming sessions. This won't be done for a while, but we still wanted them to give, give them a big shout out. So now, without further ado, let's get started with the build. Last video, we said we are going to continue our spooky trend with someone who has legions of undead following him around. Well, you can't actually get legions of Ivy, but you can get quite a few. In 3.5, Necromancy was a bit overpowered, especially for clerics, but wizards were no slouch at it either. We had one player in our group who had to get a personal fortress just to keep his undead minions in. Yeah, it was cool. And he still had a number of them to company on adventures. I think in 5th edition they didn't want that to be a problem, so they tried to limit it, and maybe just went too far in the opposite direction and made animating the dead overly limited. That doesn't mean necromancers are weak. In fact, they're a very powerful subclass. But getting your undead minions requires an ongoing investment. Not to fear, though, necromancers have a lot more going for them than just zombies. Yeah. Speaking of zombies, we are going with the Reborn lineage from Von Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. Uh, as with the Damp Fear, this lineage can be obtained uh, after you've been playing with another race. If you do, this replaces most abilities from your former race but you keep skills, proficiencies, etc. Uh, you will want to read up on the rules on this before you do it. Uh, if you are starting as a Reborn, which, uh, which we are, you gain two skills of your choice. Uh, there are a number of ways to become a Reborn, but one of them is you can claw yourself out of the grave, uh, remembering nothing of what happened before, a lot like a zombie. Uh, you aren't actually undead and can't be turned, but you do get a number of undead traits. Uh, you don't need to eat or drink, or breathe. You also don't need to sleep, and magic can't put you to sleep. You can finish long rest in four hours and remain if you remain motionless, uh, but you are conscious. Um, you have advantage on death saves as well as saves versus disease or poison, and you can resist poison damage. Uh, you also gain the memories of your past life, little flashes of memory uh, that come at you at odd times. In game terms, it means that a number of times equal per to proficiency mod fire a day, you can roll a d6 and add it to any skill check. Uh, you can do this after you see the roll, uh, but before your, your DM tells you if, you if you have succeeded. Yeah. And from zombie we get two skills, and we'll take acrobatics and perception. We aren't a dumb shambling zombie, we're the fast, resentful sort of zombie. And we aren't stupid or unaware. We also aren't rotting. We can pass for a living being, although as a DM I would probably give people who examine you closely to determine that there's something odd about you. Yeah. Maybe even have clues to your nature, such as cold skin or animals avoiding. There are no rules for this, however. It's strictly just roleplay stuff. For background, we're going to take Haunted One. You suffered a traumatic event that has scarred you and haunted you. For us, it was waking up in a grave and crawling out. However, there are many types of Reborn, and you can pick a backstory to suit how you want to play. Haunted Ones tend to get sympathy from common folk who can sense that you are a tortured soul, and they will give you shelter or other assistance if they can without endangering you. Maybe not if you walk up with a cohort of zombies and ghouls, though. Mm, yeah, they, yeah, you won't get a good reception <laughs> then. You also get two skills from a list that includes Arcana, Investigation, Religion, and Survival. We're taking Investigation and Religion. We don't have any real use for Survival, and we can get Arcana from Wizard. Yeah. Ability scores for Reborn are similar to what we've seen for a lot of the newer races. You get three plus one bonuses you can divide however you like, but you can't put more than two in one ability. Uh, we are using the point by and putting ten on Strength, we don't need strength, but we don't want to see an undead having a negative. We are putting 13 on dex and using one of the points to make it 14. Uh, we want to be quick and we can't wear armor, and we are using magic to protect, to protect ourselves, but we still want a decent armor class. We're putting 15 on constitution and using one of those points to make it 16. We need to be tough, especially since we have a d6 hit dice and are proficient with constitution saves. We're putting 15 on intelligence using our last plus one bonus, to make it 16. This is our casting stat and the ability that we use for most of our skills. We're putting 10 on Wisdom. I would really like more, but at least we don't have a negative, and 8 on Charisma. We don't need it, 
And you are a zombie anyway, so. Right. And our first level in every level will be wizard. For a full caster, you really don't need to multi-class. Other classes can benefit from taking some wizard levels, but wizards don't get much from taking levels in other classes. Some people like to start as a fighter to get heavy armor and constitution saves, which can be good if you want that kind of wizard. Mm -hmm. But it seems weird to me from a role-playing standpoint. You come back from your first big adventure, and you've been playing as kind of a mediocre fighter with a big brain. And next adventure, you're like, hey guys, I don't know how I forgot this while we were fighting those orcs, but I've been a wizard's apprentice for years. I even have this spell book. I bet that would have been handy, you know, right? Just for backstory purposes, on this character, and again, you can do whatever you want, but if I were playing it, I would say that even though I don't remember my past, I do have training as a wizard and all of this knowledge that I can't remember learning. The only thing I had with me when I escaped my tomb was a wand and this tattered spell book. I must have been a mage before being put in the grave. Mm -hmm. Since we are making 1 to 20 wizard and don't need much in the way of feats, this video is mostly going to be about spell selection and good ways to use your spells and some tactics. At first level, wizards gain arcane recovery, allowing them to recover half their spell level slots on a short rest, so one right now. We also get a spell book with six wizard spells and we know three cantrips. For cantrips, we'll take Chill Touch for a nice long range attack roll cantrip, uh, Toll the Dead for a powerful wisdom save damage cantrip, and Acid Splash. The damage on Acid Splash is only a d6 and it gets a deck save, but it can hit two targets, which is nice for a cantrip. Mm -hmm. For our spell book, we start with Detect Magic and Identify. These are staple wizard spells and also rituals, so every wizard should really take them. We're also taking Shield and Mage Armor because we need to protect ourselves. And for our last two spells, we're taking Ray of Sickness, which is a fairly mediocre damage spell, doing a 2d8 on a ranged spell attack. But it has a few advantages for us. It's Necromancy, which is thematic for us, and it can inflict the poison condition, which is a really good thing to do to an enemy. Mm -hmm. We're also taking Sleep, because at first level, Sleep can just win encounters. In our last session, appeal was DMing, and I'm playing a second level wizard. And this was our first adventure with this party. Being an elf, I was on watch after trancing for four hours, and a bunch of figures came out of the woods. After trying to communicate them, with them and finding them hostile, I cast sleep and took them all out. They turned out to be twig blights, but none of our characters knew what they were, so we tied them up and tried to get them to communicate with them, but they remained hostile, and so our fighter just killed them dead. At second level wizard, we get in our school of magic, and no surprise, we're taking necromancy. At this level, we get two abilities. Uh, the first is Necromancer Savant. Uh, which lets you copy necromancy spells with half the time, with half the cost of time and gold. You can also have a grim harvest, and this is the reason we wanted ray of sickness. Once per turn, if a spell of yours kills one or more creatures, you gain hit points equal to twice the spell's level or three times the spell level of the necromancy. Uh, this can be very nice little buff to your hit points, which will get better as we level up. We also get two more spells added to your book. For the first, for the first, we take Ice Knife. This is a nice damage spell, dealing a D10 to the target you hit with a ranged attack spell and a 2D6 to each creature within five feet, including the target uh, that fails on a Dexterity save. The radius effect, uh, area of effect on this is nice for uh, a first level spell. The second spell we will take is a new one from Sin Strict Haven's book. Uh, Guy just got this and we are going to be playing it for our next campaign, but for now we are trying out some spells uh, just to see how we like them. Uh, this one is called Silvery Bars. Uh, it is a really good and some people are saying it's too good and are banning it. Uh, so far we don't think it's overpowered, but it is really good. Uh, it lets you use a reaction when you see a creature within 60 feet succeed on an attack roll, ability check or saving throw, and make them re-roll it. Uh, this in and of itself is good, but it can also choose another creature within range, which could be yourself, and give advantage on their next attack, ability check, or save. If your DM bans this, or you just don't have the book yet, uh, there are a lot of good spells at this level. Uh, take Absorb Elements, and it can also come in handy, and so does Cause Fear. Right. And at third level, we get second level, second level spells. Mirror Image is one of the best defensive spells there is, especially for the level. If I'm playing a full wizard, I will almost always take it. And even if I'm just taking a few wizard levels, it's pretty tempting. Mm -hmm. We're also taking Rhyme's Binding Ice. This is from Fitzpin's Treasury of Dragons, and I love it. It's a cold spell, which I'm trying to use for style, keeping the undead theme, it just seems appropriate. Mm -hmm. 
and this creates a 30-foot cone of cold that deals 3d8 damage to creatures that fail a constitution save and freezes them in ice, reducing their movement to zero until they or another creature uses an action to break them out of the ice. Mm -hmm. This could end up causing your enemies to waste a lot of actions, either because they can't move or because they're breaking the ice. On a save, they take half damage and aren't frozen. This is a big downside because a lot of monsters are good at constitution saves. Yeah. At fourth level, we get an ability boost, and we're going right for intelligence, making it 18. We need to get our spell attack and save DCs up as quickly as possible. This also allows us to prepare more spells. You get two more second level spells. Uh, the first we are taking is Misty Step, giving us a bonus action teleport. Uh, sometimes the best way to avoid damage is just not to be there to get hit. Also, disappearing in a cloud of grave mist is very much in the theme for this character. Uh, for our second spell, we are taking uh, another one from Strix Haven's Wither and Bloom. This is another mediocre damage spell, but it has some good upside. First, uh, it is the only damaging necromancy spell at this level, and second, uh, it is one of the few ways wizards have to heal people. Uh, it does a, an effect of a 10-foot radius sphere, uh, which can be quite a few targets, and each creature of your choice in that area that fails a constitution save takes 2d6 ne necrotic damage, or half as much on a successful save. This isn't great compared to some something like Shatter or Snillock Snowball Swarm, but also the creature that you choose in this area that could be you uh, can roll on their unspent hit dice and gain the number plus your intelligence modifier in hit, modifier in hit points. Uh, this can be a lifesaver for allies that are unconscious and making death saves. It can also help you if you have taken a bit of damage, especially if you kill something at the same time and get healed from your Grim Harvest ability. And at fifth level, we get our third level spells, and we aren't going to take Fireball. Now, Fireball is a great spell, and there are a lot of reasons to take it. If you want to, I don't blame you. Mm -hmm. But for the flavor of this character, I'm going in a different direction. We also aren't taking Animate Dead, because we'll get it for free next level. We are taking Summon Undead from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This gets us our first Undead minion, and it's a good one. It lasts for up to an hour and uses Concentration. You can summon your Undead anywhere within 90 feet, so you can put it right into combat if you want to. And it uses the Undead Spirit stat block that you'll find in the spell description. And you have three types of Undead to choose from. Ghostly, Skeletal, or Putrid. The Ghostly one can move through creatures and objects as if they were difficult terrain, and has a Ghostly Touch attack dealing a D8 plus 3 plus a level of spell and necrotic damage. And gets a number of attacks equal to half the spell's level rounded down. So just one at this level, but if you cast this in a fourth level slot, you get two and the Spirit gets overall stronger. Mm -hmm. This applies to all the other forms as well. Also, creatures hit by the touch must make a wisdom save against your spell DC or be frightened of the spirit until the end of its next turn. If this sticks a few times, the enemy is going to be in trouble. Mm. The skeletal one has the weakest hit points and no special abilities, but it has the best damage attack. A bolt that has 150 foot range that deals 2d4 plus 3 plus the spell's level of necrotic damage. The only reason I would use this one is if I was fighting a flying enemy or something else that could keep out of melee range. So I kind of think of it as the, the figures you see of the skeletons with the bows. Oh yeah. The Putrid one is my favorite. It has a Putrid Aura that makes any creature other than you within 5 feet make a constitution saver be poisoned until the start of its next turn. And its Rotting Claw attack deals 1d6 plus 3 plus a spell level. And any creature hit by it that is poisoned must make a constitution save against your spell DC or be paralyzed until the end of its next turn. This can be devastating if some of your allies can attack it while it's paralyzed because they'll get advantage to hit and any hits are automatic criticals. Mm -hmm. For our second spell we'll take Blink. This is another great defensive spell. It isn't right for every caster, but since we don't really have any offensive uses for our reaction and command our minions on our bonus act on our turn, this works great for making us incredibly difficult to hurt about 50% of the time. Also, fading in and out of reality just seems to fit the undead theme. At 6th level, we get Animate Dead added to our spellbook. When you cast Animate Dead as a necromancer, you can animate two corpses and you can reassert control over your undead each day. You can pick two targets instead of one. Undead you create with Animate Dead or another uh, necromancy spell, the undead you create gain the following benefits. Their hit points increase by the amount equal to your wizard level and it adds your proficiency bonus to its dam weapon damage rolls. This gives you a little more kick to your creations. At this level, two skeletons or zombies can be a huge asset in combat. In addition to just attacking, they can also use the help action to give, uh, to give allies advantage on their attack rolls. They can count as an ally to set up sneak attacks. They can pin down enemies, forcing them to provoke attacks of opportunity. 
They can also use certain items. Also, with your DM's cooperation, it could be possible to equip them with armor or weapons uh, to make them more effective. In our games, we have a lot of enemies that have weapons and armor that we don't just don't care to, to loot, uh, at least at low levels. Undead could be a good place to use them. Uh, your minions can also uh, be used to carry treasure. Uh, in a game we were playing a while ago, we had a door <laughs> that we knew was trapped, but we failed to disarm it. Um, Guy's death cleric animated one of the cultists we had just killed and used it to spring the trap, which is, it was a huge explosion, but it, hey, we got the trap. So, <laughs> you, we also learned two more spells at this level, and we are taking Vampiric Touch because it is the best damage-dealing necromancy spell at this level, and you can use it every round. The drawback is you have to be in melee range, which isn't always best uh, for you. So make sure you can use blink or mirror image when you do this. Other spells to consider are fly, which is a great way to stay out of melee combat while you're on dead fight. Speak with dead, which is a great way to gather information and vary in character for you. Another good one that you might want is to get life transference, which allows you to deal 46 necrotic damage to yourself and heal someone by that same amount. For most wizards, this would be a tra bad trade-off considering wizards have a d6 hit dice and don't wear armor, but we are specifically taking spells to protect us and we have minions to hide behind, uh, so we probably aren't taking a lot of damage. And with our Grim Harvest ability, we are also getting going to be healing ourselves pretty reliably. So for us, this could be a very useful spell, getting your big damage dealer off the ground and back into a fight could end up uh, dealing more damage than you could with your offensive spells. Um, and defensively, if enemies are attacking your barbarian friend, for example, they aren't attacking you. Right. At 7th level, we get our 4th level spells, and we can choose two. For the first, we want Blight. It's a strong area of effect damage spell, but it's also necromancy, so it can trigger gr Grim Harvest. For the second, I like Greater Invisibility, which will allow you to safely cast and direct your minions without getting hurt yourself. You also can cast Summon Undead in a 4th level slot, which gives your summons better stats into attacks. Mm -hmm. At 8th level, we'll get another ability boost. We still want more intelligence, but we're using a lot of concentration spells and can definitely benefit from more hit points. So let's take Constitution here to bring in 8. Mm -hmm. We also get two more spells. Sickening Radiance is another good damage spell with a 10 minute duration, which in addition to dealing damage, causes level of exhaustion, which can be more useful than dealing damage, especially if you can force enemies to take multiple hits from it. The downside is that even though it deals necrotic damage, it's an evocation, not an necromancy. Still, it's a very good spell, and with the right setup, you kill almost anything just by exhausting them to death. Mm -hmm. For the second spell, I like Dimension Door, simply because it can solve all sorts of problems, and by this level, having teleportion, teleportation like this is almost a necessity. We can also get Stone Skin at this level, which is a great spell, but the cost of the components make it difficult to justify using regularly. Yeah. At ninth level, we're, we get fifth level spells. The first I want to talk about is Dance Macabre. It is an excellent spell allowing you to animate five corpses for one hour, which can be great, but it does depend on your DM. Creatures you animate with Animate Dead, for example, can be commanded with bonus action. Even if you have uh, them for multiple spells, you can command them all with the same bonus action. Uh, the zombies you create with Dance Macabre are also commanded with a bonus action. If your DM lets you command all your undead, including these with the same bonus action, then it is excellent for you, but if you have to separate uh, bonus action for these then is somewhat less useful. Uh, still, not bad once you have have given the general command such as kill everyone except me and my allies. Uh, you might not need to command them again every round, but if you need to keep closer control over your minions, having to alternate between commanding different groups could be a problem. Uh, Innervation is a spell I normally wouldn't take on a wizard because like Witchbolt, it monopolizes your action every turn, just deal just to deal damage and it uses your concentration so not a very great spell. The reason I consider it for this character is that one it is a damaging, damaging necromancy spell which we want and we don't necessarily need our action as we command our minions with the bonus action so this could save us some spell slots by using one one spell to damage over the course of the whole battle. Uh, if you decide against this spell hold monster and dominate person are both excellent uses for your concentration instead. Exactly. And at 10th level, we get Inured from Death, which gives us resistance to necrotic damage and means our hit point maximum can't be reduced. Mm -hmm. This is a niche ability in that necrotic damage and having your hit point maximum reduced are uncommon effects. 
but they are both very dangerous when you do encounter them. Mm -hmm. I remember when our party was fighting a demo ledge, and it was using its legendary action to reduce our wizard's hit point maximum and came very close to killing him, and no healing or damage resistance could stop him. So even though this might not come up often, it'll be great when you get it. Mm -hmm. We also get two more spells. Um, Zapil mentioned a number of good fifth level spells, and I would also like to include divination. It's very useful and it's a ritual, so you don't even need to repair it. You can just use it anytime you have 10 minutes to spare. Yeah. At 11th level, we get 6 level spells, and the one we want most is Create Undead. This is where we start getting, really getting our squad of undead. Uh, we can use this to animate up to 3 ghouls, just like, we, just like with Animate Dead, we control these for 24 hours and have to cast this again to maintain control over them. Casting this spell in, this, in a 7th level slot, you will get 4 ghouls. At 8th level, you get 5 ghouls, or 2 ghasts, or 2 whites. Um, in a ninth level slot, you will get six ghouls, three gas, or whites, or two mummies. The two mummies might actually be worth a ninth level slot, but remember, we could be casting Wish uh, in that slot instead, so that's worth keeping in mind. Uh, also, ask your DM whether you can use the same bonus action to, you, to use to command your zombies uh, to command these. I think this should be the case, but it's important to find out. Uh, now that our level... Uh, if we used one spell slot for every spell level, we can use a squad of nine skeletons or zombies and three ghouls. Eventually, we could add four more ghouls, two gas or whites, and two mummies. Uh, using one slot of every spell level, third and a higher, to control them. Uh, we do, want, do we want to do this? Not always, but the fact that we can is pretty great. I would also like to take uh, Disintegrate at this level simply because it's just straight up a great damage spell. Yeah. It's one of the best. Mm -hmm. um, at 12 level, we get an ability boost and can cap off our intelligence for maximum spell attack and safety. We also get two more spells. I like Metal Prison for just disabling an enemy, but the best one here is Magic Jar. A creature of your choice must make a charisma save, which many powerful creatures are bad at. If it fails, you possess it. You keep your intelligence, wisdom, and charisma and can use any class abilities you have that the creature's body could use, including spells but your physical stats become the creature you're possessing, and you can use its attacks and special abilities as if they were your own. You can't use any class abilities a creature has, however. There are some major downsides, though. For one, your body is catatonic and helpless while you're possessing another creature, so you need to have some plan for keeping it safe. Mm -hmm. And if the creature you're possessing dies, you have to make a charisma save against your own safe DC or die. Remember, we are bad at charisma saves. Yeah. So make a point of getting back to your own body before getting your host body killed. Hmm. Or at least make sure your party cleric has enough diamonds to bring you back to life. <laughs> at 13th level, we get 7th level spells. For starter, we want Finger of Death. It is another good damage spell, and it is necromancy, so if we kill something with it, we will heal 21 hit points from our Grim Harvest ability. I would also like to take Teleport, simply because uh, at this level, it is another, another one that is almost a necessity, and it is a wizard's job to handle this. At 14th level... Uh, you can command undead. This lets you take control of any undead within 60 feet of you. If it fails a charisma save, it becomes friendly to you and obeys your commands. Uh, if it is intelligent, it is harder to control, and if it has eight or more intelligence, it has advantage on the save and can save again every hour. Uh, but less intelligent undead remain under your control until you use this ability on a different undead. Good choices are large skeletons and zombies, mummies and shadows, all of which are fairly powerful and have less than 8 intelligence. You could also use this on a mummy you create in between adventures so that you can keep it without using a ninth level spell to keep control of it. We also get two more spells. Etherealness is an excellent spell for scouting and getting around all sorts of obstacles. Uh, another good choice is for, for cage? Force Cage. Force Cage. My bad. Uh, by itself, it can lock up one or more creatures while you take care of their allies, <clears throat> and it has many other creative uses. Uh, what I like about it is it doesn't require concentration, so we could trap a group of creatures in a forest cage, uh, then cast Sickening Radiance, and just sit and watch as they either die uh, from the damage or exhaustion. And at 15th level, we get our 8th level spells. We definitely want Horrid Will. Mm -hmm. It's a strong area effect damage spell that is also necromancy. No. Constructs and undead aren't affected, sadly, but plant creatures and water elementals get disadvantage on the save. We also get clone, which is basically, for enough money, 
me and all my friends can live forever. Hmm. It takes 120 days to grow a clone and consumes a 1,000 gold piece diamond and requires a 2,000 gold piece vessel to grow the clone in. So expensive. But when the clone is grown, it remains in stasis for as long as you can keep it safe. And when the original dies, that person's soul enters the clone, and the clone animates becoming an exact duplicate of the original with all its memories, levels, and abilities. Hmm. Stash the clone away somewhere safe, with some undead to guard it, leave it some equipment to copy your spellbook, and now you're guaranteed to stay alive. Yep. You can even make the clone younger than you, so even if you're about to die of old age, you can just kill yourself and come back as a 20-year-old version of yourself with all your powers. That's very helpful. You can also clone your allies if you want to, making them immortal as well. Mm -hmm. At 16th level, we get another ability boost uh, that we're going to use to cap off our constitution uh, to max out our concentration and get some more hit points. We also get two, two more spells. Dominate Monster is one of the best spells to just win an encounter to take over the strongest enemy and make it kill its allies. Uh, it's fun and effective. Feeble Mind is a great way to deal with uh, spell casting enemies. It could also be used on an intelligent undead to reduce its intelligence to one and then take it over with your command undead ability. Uh, when you com can't command it uh, because it can't communicate in any way, but it can recognize you as friendly, uh, follow you and protect you. So if you can grab a mummy lord or drink a lich, uh, you should do that. Uh, maybe hug him and love him and name him George. <laughs> At 17th level, we get 9th level spells. Invulnerability and Foresight are both excellent defensive spells. Foresight gives you or anyone else you choose advantage on attack rolls, ability checks, or saves, and gives everyone disadvantage on attacks against you, and this lasts for eight hours. In vulnerability is just as it sounds. You are immune to all damage. That's it. Nothing you can, nothing can do any damage to you uh, for the duration of the spell, and it lasts 10 minutes, uh, depending on concentration. There are things out there that can kill you outright, uh, and you could be paralyzed, dominated, or imprisoned, but you are still pretty well protected. Uh, you would want to take one of these and also take Psychic Scream. Uh, it is a very powerful area of effect spell that deals psychic damage. It is less powerful than Meteor Swarm, but psychic damage is a lot less commonly resisted, and this spell fits with our Necromancy vibe better. At an 8th level, we get Spell Mastery. It allows us to get first, one first and one second level spell that we can cast without using spell slots. Mm -hmm. You have to cast them at their given level. If you want to cast them to a higher level, you have to spend the appropriate spell slot. For first level spells, I like Silvery Barbs or Shield. Both are excellent ways to use your reaction every round. Mm -hmm. If your DM allows it, I would take Silvery Barbs because it's so broadly, broadly useful. You can make people reroll when they succeed on a save against your spells, or when they hit you. You can even use it when someone tries to counter or dispel one of your spells. However, if your DM doesn't allow the spell, then Shield is also great to have available for free every round. Mm -hmm. For second level spells, I'd go with Mirror Image. It's probably still your go-to defensive spell, even at this level. While there are a lot of creatures who can ignore it, there are still many more that can't. Its major weakness is that a creature with multiple attacks can burn through it pretty quickly. But if you can cast it every round, you can occupy even powerful enemies indefinitely. Mm -hmm. Misty Step could also be a great spell to have available every round. We also get two more spells at this level. I would take whatever one out of Foresight and Invulnerability that we didn't take last level. I would also take Imprisonment. This spell has a number of modes, and you'll want to read the description to see all of the possible uses. But in general, this spell means that a target makes a wisdom save, and if it fails, you win. Mm -hmm. It is imprisoned in some way that it can't get out of until something dispels the imprisonment, and some of the modes makes that very unlikely to happen, such as the Burial one. The Slumber one makes it sleep, and it can't be woken. It says nothing about damage waking it, so you can just kill it if you like. Mm -hmm. At 19th level, we get our last ability boost. Uh, we could get some benefits by raising dexterity or wisdom, but at this point, I think it's best move to take the tough feat. Uh, this should put us over 200 hit points, and combined with all of our defensive magic, should make us almost impossible to kill. Uh, we also get two more spells, which can be anything we like from any level, uh, so we can patch up any weakness from our arsenal. At 20th level, we get our signature spell, which lets us take two third level spells as our signature spells. We always have them prepared, and they don't count against the number of spells we can have prepared. We also can cast them once per day without using a spell slot. We obviously want to take Animate Dead, as, as we are probably casting it at least once. We also want Blink, because there's another defensive spell that we are likely relying heavily on. We also get our last set of two spells to finish off our spellbook. Also, the spells we have discussed are just the ones 
uh, we get from leveling up. As a wizard, we probably picked up a lot of additional spells in our spellbook. Right. And as with most wizards, this character is versatile and power. Mm -hmm. This is this one in particular is very durable with defensive magic, lots of hit points, grim harvest, and a few spells to heal ourselves. We have resistance to poison, disease, and advantage on death saves. We're just tough as nails. Yeah. We also have a limited ability to heal our allies, so we have lots of minions to protect us and kill our enemies. And the best part is these minions are completely expendable. If they die, just use a spell slot you were going to spend keeping control of them to make new ones. Crunch all you want, we'll make more. Yep. This character would make a great villain, uh, but with the Haunted One background, it could also be an anti-hero. Uh, the tragic figure using dark magic in service to a good cause, trying to find out what killed him and why he didn't stay dead. A lot of good story and roleplay potential, especially if you're DM that likes to work with backstories into the campaign. As a DM, I would probably tie this character's origins into the plot uh, of the, the big bad evil guy. Maybe he was once a powerful wizard who, uh, who was the villain's main rival, and the villain killed him but didn't count him on coming back for vengeance from beyond the grave. I hope everyone enjoyed this character and would like to play it or something similar, similar in one of your own games. Uh, with that being said, we will bring this build to a close. For our next build, we are stepping away from the dark and spooky characters, and we will be building a happy little pixie. So look forward to that. And until next time, cheers! cheers.